Welcome everybody to session 76 of the Worlds of Speculative Fiction series. I'll tell you just a little bit about what this series is in a bit, but first I want to highlight which books we're looking at this month because this is sort of a double header. We're also going to be doing this in the next session as well, looking at the next two books in this series. What are they? Well, we've got these two massive tomes by Stephen Erickson, uh, both of which are Tales of the Malazan Book of the Fallen. We'll talk about that word tale in just a minute. So we have Gardens of the Moon, the one that kicks it all off, and then we have Dead House Gates, uh, some overlap in characters and narrative between the two of them, although the setting is a bit different from one to the other. And we're talking about a very vast and complicated world. Uh, there's more to be said about that as well. But before we get too far into this, so what is Worlds of Speculative Fiction? This is a series that we began in 2016, originally in person, although we video recorded the sessions. It was hosted at the Brookfield Public Library here in the greater Milwaukee area. And people would come and we would, uh, I would present a bit about author, text, stories, narrative, philosophical themes, then we'd get into discussion. And sometimes the discussions could go quite far afield. And it's anything in speculative fiction. I tend to pick most of the authors, but eventually we got to the point where we started having the audience also give suggestions and then we vote on it each year. So, um, what are what is the focus? It is on world building, a common narrative universe that is spread across multiple short stories, or in this case, novels, entire texts. There are ten in this particular series, not counting prequels, right? So we're only going to be looking at the first two, and you can tell both of these are already pretty long stories uh, on their their own. So. We talk about some of the key characters, some of the author's insights into their own process. Sometimes we look at reviews of their work, what other people have had to say about it. We're going to get into that a bit as well. So we started out, as I said, at the Brookfield Public Library. Eventually we shifted during COVID to this format that you're seeing right now, where I will present um, anywhere from 90 to 120 minutes, depending on you know how, how deep we want to go and how much there is to cover. There's going to be a lot with, with these two. And then we have some discussion. So some of the discussion actually takes place while the video is airing for the very first time. If you're watching this in the premiere, you get to uh, use the chat function and we will go back and forth and have communication with each other about key ideas and Erickson and the whole world of Malazan. Actually, the world Malazan is in. Malazan is an empire <laughs> within that world and only a part of it. And then we have a Zoom session afterwards, so some live video conferencing. If you're watching this after the premiere, you can still comment and be involved in it. And we do this every month uh, as best as we can. We've got a whole great lineup set for the next year already, and we'll probably continue this for years to come because there's so many great authors. So speculative fiction that includes fantasy, which is what these are, science fiction, horror, weird tales, um, alternate history, magical realism, nonsense stories, we could say philosophical humor as well, and all the blends of these in between and some other things uh, on the side. So uh, what are we going to be doing? We're going to be delving deep into these two volumes. I do want to say something uh, at the start before we kick everything off, we'll talk about the world building, but I want to talk about the structure 
of this narrative and the density of it because a lot of people find it quite daunting. So that is where we're going to begin. And then we've got a lot of other great stuff to cover. So settle back. If you've got a snack or some popcorn or whatever it is you're going to enjoy, uh, take a, you know, a seat. We're going to make our way in a long march, not quite military like the, the Malazan people here, but we're going to march through these texts and see what they have to say to all of us. In these sessions, we usually dive right into something right off the bat, maybe world building or biography or something else. But this time around, I think it's really quite important for me to address something that stems from what other people are saying about the Malazan Book of the Fallen novels, namely that they are so difficult to read and understand and make sense out of what's going on. So I myself have been told, ah, you're probably not going to be able to figure out what's really happening until you've read the third novel. And, you know, that would be pretty problematic given that we've only gone through these two at this point. A lot of people are saying, oh, you better, you know, bookmark the Malazan wiki because you're going to need it so much for everything in order to make sense out of what's happening. You know, Erickson doesn't engage in any exposition or world building. He doesn't hold your hand as a reader and help you into his world. And, you know, like a lot of things that people say about literature, that's pretty hyperbolic, meaning that's overplaying their hand a bit. Now, I will say that I can't definitively tell you that with every single character, every single location, every single plot twist, I fully understand every single thing that's happening in these two books on a first reading. But I did not find <clears throat> the difficulty that was advised to me I'd better be on the, the lookout for and be ready for in going into Gardens of the Moon, nor did I find that with Dead House Gates. And I will say that this is helped out significantly by the fact that there are some, you know, very small appendices, you could call them, given in these texts under Dramatis Personae. Now, in this, this newer copy that I've got, it's at the very front of the book, which is probably the smartest place to put it. In the, the older one I had it, it was, well, it is actually at the end in the glossary as well. And so, you know, there's only a few pages, but I think that's quite enough to make sense out of at least some of the things that are going on. And there's a little bit of expansion, I think, in the Dead House Gates one as well. I will say this. It, it is a story where with, with Gardens of the Moon, you are thrown right into the middle of it. And you kind of have to figure out what is going on by putting things together through illusions that are being made. Sometimes you have to revise what you were thinking about a particular character, a people, a history, because it's revealed that there's more to the story as the tales go on, right? And it is a very complicated tapestry that is woven. There's a lot of point of view characters. There are a lot of different locations. There are many different, let's call them by the traditional term, factions at odds with each other or colluding with each other, trying to use each other, trying to get information from each other. But this is the good news for readers. It's not something that's insurmountable, nor that you actually have to wait until the third book to be able to make sense of or understand. That is clearly not the case. And while it may be helpful to go to the Malazan wiki or to other sites that tell you something about like the races 
or the peoples or the backstory or the characters or the warrens or the cards or you pick whatever else you want. I don't think that that's actually necessary in order to piece together and to appreciate the ongoing complicated tale that's being told. Now, I mentioned this in social media after reading through Gardens of the Moon, and a lot of people were like, well, you know, you're somebody who teaches philosophy and can unpack, you know, Hegel's phenomenology. You do that for a living. So obviously you're an outlier and the average reader is going to have much more difficulty than you. And I will certainly grant that, right? I think that perhaps by the types of works that I tend to study, as well as what I consume in literature, Maybe I'm a little bit better equipped for that, but I don't think that I'm radically different than any intelligent reader would be. So if you are one of these people who's heard how tricky, how complicated, how murky and obscure these Erickson uh, Malazan books are, don't worry about that. Dive in and see what you actually think of them what what you make of it you know don't take other people's word as like the gospel truth about it it doesn't say you have to dismiss what they have to say especially if they've been down the path and you haven't but it would be smart to put that those worries those preconceptions aside and just dive into this incredibly complex world and see what you can actually make of it. You may have to go back and reread. You may have to turn to the glossary and be like, all right, what is going on here? That's perfectly fine. But, you know, I think that any intelligent reader should be able to get quite a lot out of the very first reading of these two Malazan novels. The narrative universe of these two first of the Malazan Book of the Fallen novels is incredibly vast and rich in a number of different dimensions. So we better spend a bit of time looking at very broad patterns, dimensions, whatever we want to call them, aspects of the world building that is going on primarily in these, these two volumes. Obviously, there's more to say as we proceed through the series, but I'm going to try to stick to what we have just in these because, I mean, you can tell by looking at the size of these, it's already quite a lot. And I do want to point out certain features of these books that you might want to check out. So... You know, one of them is the world itself, and each of them does contain maps of where the action is taking place. So, uh, Gardens of the Moon, Genabacus, which is an entire continent, and then um, Darugistan, which is one of the main locations, the, the key city involved in it. Dead House Gates is on a different continent, that of the Seven Cities, and so we have uh, maps of that as well. Um, so we get, you know, Coltane's March, the first half, the second half, some rather detailed maps. And then we also have Dramatis Personae, the, you know, key characters. Those are pretty lengthy. There's a lot of people represented in these stories, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. And then at the end of each of them, we have, uh, we have a glossary, which is quite helpful as well, that includes, um, you know, place names, the world of sorcery, titles and groups, the deck of dragons, which we'll get to in just a bit, different uh, peoples, ascendants, you know, and so there's, there's a lot of information being conveyed there. And it may be very helpful for the reader to have that uh, available at hand. There is, of course, the Malazan wiki that you can look all these things up in as well. So what do we want to say about this world? To begin with, it is a vast world, right? 
There are a number of continents, many of which we're not going to see until the later books. There is no absolutely definitive map of the entire world, although there's, there's you know, quite a few out there that Erickson has said, yeah, these are pretty good. Um, and it is not only a vast world spatially, it's also a vast world temporally or historically, we could say. So as opposed to <clears throat> our world, which, you know, as far as we know, um, we are the sentient species that arose and then came to dominate this planet effectively. I mean, there's other pretty smart species, but none of them developed technology or culture in the way that we did. This is a world in which humanity is a major race, but a fairly new race. And there are far older races, remnants of which are still left, which made a major impact on the world that um, the characters and events are taking place in. It's also an incredibly complex and rich world as well. Many different cultures, important cities, uh, literature, backstories, all of that sort of stuff is woven into this and in ways that are not always that easy to follow and which are often provided in a fragmentary way. I'll also say that we have, you know, I mentioned the Dramatis Personae, we have a vast number of point of view characters and then many other characters who are being glimpsed through those characters' eyes. And, you know, you might actually need the Dramatis Personae just to keep track of who's who. And sometimes their loyalties will change or they'll be revealed as not being exactly who we thought they were. And it's, it's one of the really standout features of this work that there are so many interesting characters who are being sketched out. Uh, we learn about their motivations, we see their interactions, we see their history, we see what they learn on the way. And we can say that, to use an old metaphor, there are wheels within wheels within wheels, right? Everything is this very complicated web of conflicts and alliances and working with people and revelations. So that's part of what is happening here. As I mentioned, geographically, it's a pretty vast world. There are some you know, oceans and continents. Um, the ones that we're concerned with in these two books are primarily um, that of the uh, Genobacchus, which is uh, where most of the action in Gardens of the Moon is taking place. The Seven Cities, which is on part of a con vast continent, but the continent itself is often called the Seven Cities, even though it includes much more than that in Dead House Gates. But we also learn about um, the home of the Malazan Empire, uh, Quantali being discussed as a place in this as well. And, you know, we should mention one other continent, um, the Falari Isles, which some of the characters hail from. So that's only part of the world that's eventually going to get sketched out in later novels in it. And I mentioned that we are only one, we humans, only one of the races that are involved in this big long story. So there are what are called the founding races and we don't really know that much about them in these two books. We get little snippets of information. Um, the one that we probably learn the most about are the um, Imas, which become the Tlan Imas. They were uh, one of the races that decided to engage in genocide and wipe out one of the other races that we'll talk about just in, in a moment. And so in order to do that, they underwent a ritual that effectively transformed them into undead warriors who could make it through 
glaciers and hunt down the the uh, second race, the Joghut. Uh, we actually get to see a Joghut tyrant towards the end of Gardens of the Moon, a very powerful uh, type of creature. And we meet another uh, Jog as well in Dead House Gates, Ikarium, who has lost his memory due to what he actually did in his lifetime and who's accompanied by Atrell, one of his, his close friends, who is sort of his keeper. But there are two other races as well. We hear about the Fulcril um, Asil, and we don't learn much about them in this. And then there's a yet even older uh, original race, the Kachain Chamale, and we're not going to learn much about them at all, except for the fact that they had technology that is still in use. So in um, Gardens of the Moon, the moon spawn is something that apparently they created at one time. So we've got these other races, and then there are other races besides those. Uh, there were dragons, and we get to see one of these original dragons, the Elaint, and then we have the Tista Andi. We see quite a bit of them in this story. The children of darkness, they're often called. They have, you know, uh, dark skin, and they are not human. They came out through these magical warrens and um, they are ruled as much as you can rule them by uh, an ascendant on Amander Rake uh, who is sort of their you know great leader king a uh, very strong scary guy who can actually take the form himself of a dragon and talk to dragons um, and the Tista Andi are fighting along with the warlord Caledon Brood against the Malazan with an alliance of others as well. And we get hints of there being other Tiste in Garden of the Moon. And then we find out about them a bit more, but not that much in Dead House Gates, the Tista Adur, who are gray-skinned, we actually find, about, find out about them because there are Tista Andi and Tista Edur on this, um, let's call it a magical boat, where their heads have been cut off and their heads are still undead, alive, and they are rowing the, the boat when commanded to, to do so. So those are non-human races. There's other non-human races as well of, you know, sort of, you could say lesser stature. And then there's all these different human cultures and cities, and they're often fighting with each other. They're, they have their own different uh, religions and uh, political organizations and doing what it is that they're doing. Some of them are nomadic. Some of them are settled and have been, you know, in places forever. And they've, they have all sorts of walks of life as well as you can expect. So here we ought to talk about the Malazan Empire. So these are, you know, tales of the Malazan Book of the Fallen. Where we begin the story is with the Malazan armies in both of these books, right? Well, I mean, technically speaking, that's not quite correct because we have the, the uh, possession of this uh, girl who becomes sorry and then uh, takes on a different name after she's no longer possessed, right? So... But the, the main action that's going on is the Malazan military. And we have all sorts of other people from this empire. And at first, it reads as if, okay, this is the you know, totalitarian evil empire trying to take over everything. And we've got these soldiers, which include you know, mages, you know, magic users, and sappers, and all sorts of other people, including spies as well, and assassins. Um, and they're all caught up within the workings of this vast, you know, not just bureaucracy, but, but you know, military um, empire that's taking over everything. And then the other people are trying to resist it. 
But we actually find out as the story proceeds, this is not a empire that's been around a very long time. And there are other organizations that are kind of big and scary too, that are just being hinted at. We're not fully revealed at this point in time, but we're going to get to see them in the later novels. Now, the other peoples in these continents are not cool with being taken over by the Malazan Empire, which is able to, when it conquers a place, it's kind of like the old pattern that we see in the Persian Empire and the Roman Empire. You know, they're not going to impose any sort of official religion. Uh, you pay your taxes, we'll let you keep some of the people in place, but if you revolt, we're going to crush you. And, you know, you'd better uh, toe the line, so to speak, right? Not cause trouble. And then they use the places that they've conquered as grounds to draw new soldiers from. So a lot of the soldiers are not from the original Malazan, let's call it homeland. They're from all over the empire. The Malazan empire is quite good at taking people <clears throat> who were originally opposed to it and incorporating them into that empire. And so this provides us with an incredibly interesting backdrop for war, for conflict, for power, for adventures, for all sorts of other things that are taking place. We should mention that the empire includes not just an emperor or empress. In this case, <clears throat> the empress is La Cine, who is supposed to have assassinated her predecessor, uh, Kelanved, uh, and dancer, his, his mage and assassin who came up with him. And we find out that Kelanved was the originator of this empire. First, he took over an island along with dancer, and then he began spreading the empire to all sorts of other places, including um, taking on, let's call it possession or rulership of some of the Tlan Imas, undead warriors who he could use. And then La Cine, by the time that the action begins in Gardens of the Moon, has been in power for a while but not actually that long. And the empire is still making progress in conquering, but things are actually getting quite thin. In Gardens of the Moon, the main opposition is coming from uh, these, these cities along with um, uh, Caledon Brood and Anamander Rake. And as we're going to find out, some, let's call them, supernatural elements as well. And um, what we have is a very complex power structure that includes as main characters adjuncts. The adjuncts, uh, there's two of them, one in, in one book, one in the other, are sort of second in command, stand-ins on the spot for the empress. Uh, and then we have high fists who are military governors of very large regions with fists underneath them as military commanders. Um, the um, main action in Dead House Gates will actually be, as it, you know, it's called the chain of dogs led by the fist Coltane, who himself had fought against the Malazan Empire and then became one of the military commanders in it. Uh, we also interestingly have another order, which is you know, sort of like you could call them their, their CIA, right? Their uh, covert operations group, assassins and mages working together to undermine uh, problematic powers. And these are called the Claws. We later find out in Dead House Gates that the Claws replaced a earlier group um, associated with Dancer, the Talons, right? And they, they fought against each other. So we've got this vast empire, but we also have all this other cool stuff being narrated. There is an uprising in Dead House Gates, the whirlwind, a rebellion against 
the Malazan Empire that is going to sweep them from that continent and you know liberate these people, but perhaps also put them under a different yoke as well. Now, I mentioned other powers, right? So this is another really, really key dimension of this world. This is a world in which magic works, but although it's got a very complex and rich conception of magic and its workings, the system, if you will, is never fully sketched out. It is connected with things called warrens, which are not the only source of magical power, but one main source of magical power. Most human beings can only access one warren. Some people, like one of the main characters, Ben, can access multiple ones. And um, these are locations within a magical space that can emerge into the world that uh, Malazan is, is taking place within. And some of these are very, very old, like the Warrens of Chaos, which connect up with the, the other Warrens. Um, and we actually get a whole listing of the different Warrens, those that can be accessed by human beings, um, you know, corresponding to different houses and different matters. So we have, for example, you know, the Warren of Danul, the path of healing, the Warren of uh, Menias, the path of shadow and illusion, Hood's path, the path of death. But we also have other Warrens like um, Starval de Malian, uh, the Tiam Warren, the first Warren, right? Not accessible by humans, typically. Uh, we have others that are Warrens for, you know, the Tlan Imas or the Tist Andi or the Jaghut. So each of these is a, a source, a locus of magical power that can go places, that can take you places, that has characters of its own. And magic is done in significant part by accessing, by opening one's warren and there's a whole variety of mages from you know the lowest you know squad mages and other magic users witches warlocks all the way up to high mages that might be in charge of an entire army or you know particular leaders might be mages as well assassins are sometimes themselves mages and Objects can be magical. For example, the, the sword that um, one of the characters carries in Garden of the Moon. Paran is the, the character who does that. So we've got all this stuff going on as well. And interestingly, this is an equal opportunity universe. Men and women, various races, can all access magic. It's all about figuring out the connections. So there is no like automatic hierarchy involved in that. And it leads to a, a different world. We also have the ascendants or gods, people who become powerful, not just politically, but in terms of magic, but also we could say in terms of force of will and character can become powerful beings. And so this is where a lot of the gods have come from. And the gods mess around in not just human, but all the other races <laughs> affairs on this, this world as well. Gods can be quite recent as we're going to find out. And many of them are associated into particular houses, each of which has its warren and its own sort of organization. So I'll just read you the, the names of these. Now, these are from the deck of dragons, which replicate the different houses. So we have high house life, high house death, high house light, high house dark, high house shadow which is also quite important. And High House Shadow is one that 
has been around, but hasn't done an awful lot until fairly recently. And High House Shadow has two characters in particular, Shadow House, the ruler of High House Shadow, who is, along with the Rope or Cotillion, the assassin of High House Shadow, opposed to the Malazan Empire and trying to do everything they can to undermine it. So that's a very interesting feature as well. There's a lot of monkeying around on the part of the gods. One of the gods that plays a really important role in Gardens of the Moon is Opon, the twin jesters of chance. One of the jesters is male, one of the jesters is female, embodied in a spinning coin that uh, Crocus, you know, a, a young thief who has a very important uncle who unfortunately will die by the end of Gardens of the Moon in the uh, key city of this, um, which... Uh, here we go. Uh, Darujistan gets represented by this particular map. It's kind of a, a cool, you know, seedy place, right? Um, that is one of the interventions of these ascendants or gods. And ascendants can be killed. Ascendants can be destroyed. And we're actually going to find out, not so much in the first novel, but in Dead House Gates, there are also these Azath houses that develop. We, we do actually get an Azath house towards the end of Gardens of the Moon, a new Azath house, where power is reckless and unchecked and could destroy things. These houses arise. And one of them is, in fact, the dead house of the dead house gates on the island where you know the Malazan Empire begins. So these are prisons of power. They're all connected to each other through its own warren, which allows travel between these. And so that's another key feature of this world as well. I've already mentioned the houses. Um, the houses are, you could say, factions of these ascended or divine beings. And there are others who are attempting to ascend as well. So we should mention there are shapeshifters called Solotaken, which are the ones who turn into a single, uh, often terrifying thing, giant sea serpents, bears, dragons, things like that, and uh, divers, which can turn into hordes of things, spiders, rats, all sorts of other uh, kinds of pack creatures as well. And then we also have in How Shadow, the Hounds of Shadow, which are these terrifying, gigantic, wolf-like dogs that uh, hunt at the command, but are probably old, much older than the master of the, the House of Shadow, um, Shadow Throne himself. So this gives you an idea about the world that we're looking at. We haven't yet gone into any sort of plot points or philosophical themes, but at least now you get a sense of the vastness of the world that are uh, sort of hinted at. Again, you know, there's so much to this, and uh, a lot of it is dealt with in a rather fragmentary way in these two volumes. When it comes to Steven Erickson, or as he was known before that, Steve Rune London, much of his biography is actually a listing of the books that he has written and published at various points in time. There's not an extensive biography pertaining to all sorts of personal matters, although there are many interviews out there. So he's Canadian. He was born in Toronto in 1959, which makes him, you know, 64 at, at this time. And um, he grew up in Winnipeg, another important Canadian city, attended the University of Victoria, eventually earned his degree in archaeology and anthropology, and did a lot of 
work in North America and in Central America as well, working for about 18 years in the field and continuing to do digs from time to time. He also attended the Iowa Writers Workshop, which is a pretty important and prestigious place to, to go. And it's great for making contacts, learning how the business works. He met and married uh, Claire Thomas, and they have uh, one child, Bowen, who is now in college himself. And another very important person in his life is his friend Ian Cameron Esselmont, who he uh, in the 1980s began collaborating on something that would eventually become Malazan. And it's worth noting that there are two authors within the Malazan narrative universe. Both Erickson and Esselmont have written books, but it originally started out as a setting for Dungeons and Dragons around 1982, and then they shifted it to a different role-playing game system that was becoming quite big at the time, the GURPS that came out from Steve Jackson Games, which originally was known for little card games and then car wars, if you remember your tabletop games from the past. And then they came out with this generic universal role-playing system that would take whatever you wanted really and allow you to turn it into stuff and even like have crossover um you know from this this particular system to this one so they started building out malazan this incredibly rich world within that as a place where you could play and you know it's interesting because erickson will mention that um you know role-playing games were actually a major influence along with a whole bunch of other authors for the development of this um this series this world this this whole conception his first books were not actually within this fantasy series He's uh, given a grant to, to work on his master's thesis, and part of that will be uh, his first no, uh, you know, story cycle, A Ruin of Feathers, which is published in 1991. He begins starting writing Gardens of the Moon around that time. Originally, he and um, his friend uh, Esselmont had conceived of that as a movie script, but they were unable to find anybody who wanted to produce it, which is probably a good thing given the complexity of it. It's, you know, there've been talks of adapting this material, but you think about the successes and much more often failures of adapting fantasy literature and sci-fi literature for that matter, to the big screen or to the television and the prospects are probably not great for a series this complex. He publishes um, several other novellas and, and novels in the 1990s, um, Stolen Voices. Uh, in 1995, they moved to the UK. He begins working at uh, Toyota in their communications division in 1998. He publishes two works, uh, um, Revolvo and Other Canadian Tales, and a novel, This River Awakens. And then by 1999, he has successfully developed out Gardens of the Moon into the shape that we find it now. And it gets published in 1999. And it's a, uh, an overnight sensation, you could say. It gets a lot of traction, especially on fantasy sites. And we're talking about the early years of the internet at that point. And that might be partly responsible for the, you know, not the success of the novel, but the, the extent of its success because people can talk with each other. And, and, you know, this is a very important feature of things. And then something really interesting happens. It's published by a company called Transworld. And 
once it's a success, he gets another offer from another company, uh, Orion, and then Transworld makes him an, a counter offer and it becomes one of the largest advances up until that time, uh, 675,000 British pounds offer to write the 10 book series. Now, of course, they didn't give him the entire advance up front. It's going to be sort of, you know, rolled out over time. But this was a, a very significant uh, amount of money that allowed him to quit working at Toyota and just write full time. But by this time, he's actually uh, really, you know, developed as a writer. So a 10 book series is certainly something conceivable. And I'm just going to run through the books and the dates. So in the Malazan universe, now remember, this is just the books that, um, that uh, Erickson himself is writing. Esselmont is also writing books in this narrative universe, but we won't talk about those. So uh, 1999, we've got Gardens of the Moon, 2000, Dead House Gates, 2001, Memories of Ice, an even longer book than those two, 2002, House of Chains, 2004, Midnight Tides. Now you notice the, the, it's slowing down a little bit, but still, you know, pretty massive books coming out every two years. 2006, The Bone Hunters. 2007, Reaper's Gale. 2008, Toll the Hounds. 2009, Dust of Dreams. And 2011, bringing the series of Malas on the House of the Fallen, but not the narrative universe, to a close the crippled God. So that's 10 books brought out over the course of 12 years. Pretty amazing, uh, that, that productivity there. And that's not all of the Malazan books that Erickson wrote. There's also Esselmont's, as we pointed out. There is the, uh, Carcanus Trilogy, which is about the Tisti uh, races. 2012, we have Forge of Darkness. 2016, Fall of Light. And he's still currently working on Walk in Shadow. So those are about this earlier race. These are prequels. And then there's the Witness Trilogy, which is still ongoing as well in 2021. Uh, the God is Not Willing came out. He's currently working on No Life Forsaken. And then we have an, a series of novellas that are tales of Baukelen uh, and uh, Corbel Brooch. And these are coming out from 2002 to 2020. And it's interesting because the books that he is writing and Esselmont are writing they overlap to some extent. As a matter of fact, they've actually come up with, and you can find this online, a suggested order of readings that includes all of those books by Erickson as well as all of Esselmont's Malazan series books as well. So he's still a living writer and he's still occasionally doing archeological work. The last dig out in Mongolia, there were some problems with that. But he's he's still quite active, and they've moved you know they moved back to Canada, uh, and then back to the to the UK again, and so he's a very productive writer, uh, stays engaged in conversations online with interviews at cons, and apparently is quite accessible to his fans. So. Quite an interesting thing. We can expect more Malazan novels coming out, but fortunately, as far as this particular thing goes, the Malazan uh, Book of the Fallen is finished, and you know we're going to be primarily focusing just on these two early ones from the end of the last century and the beginning of this one. I think that when we're fortunate enough to have the 
wealth of interviews that we have with an author like Steven Erickson, we may as well take advantage of them. They provide us insights into how he understands and he thinks about his own works, in particular, these two novels uh, of the 10 of the Malazan Book of the Fallen. So there's a lot of cool things that we can delve into. We're only going to kind of scratch the surface in this, but there's a couple where I think we do have to drill down. So we're going to begin with this Fantasy Hive interview from 2018, where Erickson is asked, when you're creating something as complex as Malazan Book of the Fallen, how do you go about planning something that massive? And Erickson says, you know what? I look back on it and I literally can't remember how I pulled that off. I started Gardens of the Moon in 1991 or 1992, and I wrote the draft. I couldn't get a publisher living in Canada at the time. And even then I sort of had in my head where this is going to go. And there were going to be 10 books in all, which I knew wasn't ever going to, I wasn't ever going to bring up when pitching the project. We initially pitched it as a trilogy just I didn't want to scare anybody away because, you know, you make the promise as an unproven writer and it's a pretty major promise. But I had scenes that were towards the end of the 10th novel sitting in my head for 15 years. So then it was a question of, well, what do I have to do to be patient enough to take my time getting there? Because if I wanted any sort of emotional context of those scenes, as I felt viscerally when I had them in my head, I had to sort of prepare the reader. And in some respects, it took almost all 10 novels to prepare the readers for those final scenes. And I had immense ambition at the time and was driven, very driven. Once I'd gotten the green light for the 10 book series, there was really no stopping me. And there was even a fear of dying before I could finish it. I remember being struck by a quote I read somewhere when Robert Jordan when his, in his last few years at a signing where he signed a book for an elderly woman who expressed a fear of her dying before he finished the series. And of course, the bitter irony being Jordan himself dying before he could finish the series. And the closer I got to it, there was a disastrous decision to do some archaeology in Mongolia between books at 9 and 10, and then almost killing me from a stomach bug and then a spider bite. It just started getting ridiculous. Then I realized <clears throat> if I killed over in Mongolia between book 9 and 10, wherever my gravestone was in the world, people would annually piss on it. So I thought, okay, I got to get this thing finished. I came back. I was living in Falmouth at the time. So I came back to Cornwall and just wrote my ass off and got it done. So fear can be a driving force in these things. And then he's asked, you created the world with Ian Esselmont, who's also written his own series set in the same world. What's it like sharing your baby with another writer? And he answers, well, it's like two parents sharing a baby. You equally contributed to whatever genetic progeny you produce. So if you look at my dedication to Gardens of the Moon, it's basically to Ian Esselman, worlds to conquer, worlds to share. And I'll just, you know, show you that right there, right? Um, when I said that, I was saying that to reassure him because nobody else knew he was going to step forward and write some Malazan novels. But I wanted him to be very clear it was a shared world as far as I was concerned, and the door was open for him. So he picked that up and dropped the PhD he was doing at the time <clears throat> and had to rethink his future. And I'm so pleased that his latest trilogy, Origins of Empire, is doing so well. <clears throat> he seems to have found his stride in terms of the narrative length, and he's just clearly having great fun writing that stuff. And that's the stuff we actually gamed, so that's a lot of fun for me. I get to tap in and see what he's up to and how he remembers things versus how I remember things, and then how these things change for the purposes of fiction. It's a lot of fun. Now, I think that's very telling and interesting. It shows a sort of generosity and friendship that sometimes comes through in characters in these novels, particularly, I would say, mimicked a little bit in Dead House Gates with the two elder races uh, characters, one of whom doesn't quite remember his own past, the other of which guides him around in friendship. Now, I'm not going to say that that's a direct parallel, but you could easily think of other writers not being willing to share their universe like that. 
the universe of these books of the fallen is so rich and vast that it admits of somebody else working with that same stuff. Somebody else who kind of has a right to do that. In Justin Mo interview, 2018, he's asked, Dead House, Dead House Gates, like Gardens of the Moon, is about a rebellion. For the first one, you chose the perspective of rebels. And for the second one, we have the opposite perspective with the Wiccans. In a certain way, did Dead House Gates uh, be considered as an answer to Gardens of the Moon? And, and Erickson says, Yes, I suppose in some ways. What we gained, of course, was the creation of the Malazan Empire, and that was the foundation for the novels. But no empire is monolithic in terms of its point of views. Normal lives are caught in the currents of their lives and history. They may not agree, but they're being pulled along by that current. An empire, like anything else, like a country, for example, will have diverse points of views opinions, and even sensibilities regarding loyalty. The idea for the second novel was how to look at how even a large war or rebellion eventually reduces down to a soldier beside you, and that was kind of the approach to Dead House Gates. Now he's asked as well, after Gardens of the Moon, you left Ganabacus and Whiskey Jack to go on to another continent with three of your characters. Why didn't you stay on Ganabacus for the second book? So Erickson says, well, there's a bit of a story behind that. After finishing my first draft of Gardens of the Moon, I started on what would become Memories of Ice. I thought that was the second book. Back then, we didn't have computers the way they are now. I was using a word processor that had a floppy disk that could only contain in all 64 kilobytes of memory, so I needed multiple floppy disks to build a novel, and I lost them. I was about 350 pages into Memory of Ice, and I lost them all. I was so disappointed, I thought, I can't sit and start rewriting now 350 pages. So I put that story aside and wrote Dead House Gates which became the second novel. It's entirely by accident that the order of the three books is what it is. Isn't that fascinating to learn? In uh, Neco Necoplus uh, interview, uh, we find he's asked, in the past I've seen you mention stylistic changes that were at the forefront of revisions you made from Gardens of the Moon to subsequent novels. I was wondering if you can describe this progression personally as a writer, and what would you point to as the chief difference and influences to that change from that book to Dead House Gates. So Erickson says, In many ways, I approached Gardens of the Moon as I would any fiction project. I had been schooled in the non-emotive style prevalent in contemporary fiction. I wrote in the style of he said, she said, rather than he, she, graded, growled, hissed, etc. And where I used such descriptive add-ons, they were once removed. In a sense, this didn't fit with the genre style. Readers pursuing a heightened plot with adventure and excitement foremost in their minds are used to a fully delivered emotional content to dialogue, a stylistic shortcut, the kind that rankles Stephen King. They don't want to have to guess or prize out that context. I was working hard at conveying emotional context through gesture and inference rather than anything more obvious. The editorial push was to work those emotives in, which I did, although with some discomfort. I have no ill feelings about that. There was enough unusual, challenging elements in the novel that anything we could do to ease the path was probably a good thing. Over time, however, and through the subsequent books, I have worked back to something close to my original style, one I am most comfortable with. I think I can get away with it now, since by this time my readers know how to read my stuff. Specific to Dead House Gates, there were eight years between writing that one, my, writing my first draft of Gardens of the Moon, um, eight years spent writing contemporary fiction. Finding a publisher for Gardens was a huge boost to my confidence, and I set about writing Dead House Gates with a sharp focus on what I wanted to achieve. Furthermore, I felt I could build from the introduction established by Gardens, even though the setting takes a sharp shift. Also, Dead House Gates felt tight from the very start, very deliberate, word by word, whereas Gardens begins with more of a wild ramble and only tightens up towards the end, and even there it's with a sly wink. 
quite different from the tone of the conclusion of Dead House Gates. I wanted to get effing serious with Dead House Gates. Years ago, I had a mentor observe that my writing was not immediately inviting in tone and theme. But rather than fight it myself, I should endeavor to take the reader by the hand gently, even when my ultimate intention was the drag, to drag that reader into hell. He gave good guidance, I think. The more a writer writes, the more the writer realizes just how manipulative language can be. Musing on it, though, I don't know if Dead House Gates opens by taking anyone by the hand unless it's to snap a shackle on the wrist, which ac actually is pretty accurate. But I knew the opening scene was evocative and the first few lines to my mind still stand among the best openings among any novels. So we've, we get a good bit of you know, reflection on what's going on in the composition of these two novels. Now let's turn to looking at world building. Clearly there's world building happening in the narration, in the tale, in what's going on with these books. There was a controversy a while back that was spurred by M. John Harrison, who wrote in his blog, every moment of a science fiction story must represent the triumph of writing over world building. World building is dull. World building literalizes the urge to invent. World building gives an unnecessary permission for acts of writing, indeed for acts of reading. World building numbs the reader's ability to fulfill their part of the bargain because it believes it has to do everything around here if anything is going to get done. Above all, world building is not technically necessary. It is the great clomping foot of nerdism. It is the attempt to exhaustively survey a place that isn't there. A good writer would never try to do that, even with a place that is there. It isn't possible. And if it was, the results wouldn't be readable. They would constitute not a book, but the biggest library ever built, a hallowed place of dedication and lifelong study. This gives us a clue to the psychological type of the world builder and the world builder's victim and makes us very afraid. Now, in uh, the Pat's Fantasy Hot List interview in 2007, Erickson is asked, needless to say, a multitude of people disagree with Harrison's postulation. What's your take on Harrison's post and the concept of world building in general? So here's what Erickson had to say. I wrote my response to that question some time ago. I've pasted it here. Two observations come to mind. The first is that, with 40 years of reading in the genre of fantasy and science fiction, I cannot recall one instance of a writer committing the flaws as described by Harrison, so either I have been extremely lucky or he has been profoundly unlucky. It is unfortunate he cited no examples to support his assertions, making any effort at rebuttal all the more difficult. In fact, the only writer who comes to mind who might be said to have gone overboard in his world building is James Michener, and of course he said his novels in the real world. The second observation is this. Every writer world builds in every genre, including contemporary literary fiction, and indeed when writing nonfiction as well. So he's going all in on, on the idea of world building. He says world building is nothing more than, uh, there we go, Nothing more or less than the selection of details surrounding the characters establish a setting and with it a place in which to immerse those characters in the story of their lives. It is necessary, essential to storytelling. Further, is he asserting the notion that there is something uniquely flawed when world building is in the fantasy or science fiction genre, suggesting perhaps that the process is somehow pure when electing to write tales set in our contemporary world? If so, that would be an extraordinary, laughable conceit. And then he gives two examples of world building in the contemporary world. He talks about a biography of a child soldier from Sierra Leone. The setting exists as real as any other in this world, yet the narrative relating the author's harrowing life there is anchored in the details he relates, scene by scene, event by event. Is this a perfect rendition of life in Sierra Leone? We can presume it's close, but we also accept it is selective, founded on personal experiences. It is a world built, by, built exclusively on relevant details, recollected by one person at a time, and a sequence of places. He says, isn't this world building? says, the other book also concerned Africa. 
Anne recounted a lifelong exploration of the continent and its peoples by a Polish journalist. Once again, he builds a world, selects his details to support his various interpretations of places, events, and cultures. This, too, is selective and subjective. This, too, is world-building. The point is, as far as I can see it, Harrison is beating a straw dog. In the narrow definition of world building he provides, um, he goes on, he ends up in, in effect railing at something that does not even exist, and if it does, is exemplified so rarely that attacking it is pointless. For what it's worth, I see this as yet another example of how the internet can legitimize virtually anything anyone chooses to say, even when with a moment's thought it becomes clear that what is being said is at best irrelevant at worst, nonsensical and fatuous. And then he says, I'm just responding to the quote. I've not read Harrison. If he does not world build in his fiction, he's unique in the history of literature and should be canonized. And then he ends. This is very interesting. I am not interested in joining some ferocious debate. Ferocious debate did take place regarding this. Not with Harrison, not with anyone else with an opinion. So I hereby conclude my commentary on the subject. Don't bring it up again. Erickson is telling us you cannot avoid doing world building in fiction or even in nonfiction. And this is going to lead us in two very interesting directions. One has to do with one of the key elements of his stories here, magic. The other has to do with being labeled as being postmodern. So, in the discussion of um, magic in the Caballero de Arbol Son Sonriente interview from 2023, um, he's asked, magic is another great pillar of your saga in contrast to other visions of fantasy which, exist, which insist on explaining the smallest detail about how their magical systems work. In Malazan, much of the way to understand it relies on the reader himself and the connections he establishes. Do you think this is what keeps the freshness that fantasy needs to continue to amaze the reader, to maintain the sense of wonder that people want in this genre? Do you think it is negative to give the reader spoon feeding? Erickson will say this, rule-based structured magic is just technology in a universe with physics different from ours. Using the same basic set of functions, if this, then that, if not this, then not that, as machinery. For me, at least, the presence of magic in the Malazan world is all about the function of magic in myths and legends as evocations of not just wonder, but also the presence of inexplicable forces beyond our understanding. That said, I don't think the originators of the stories we now call myths and legends were as credulous as some people think. I think they well understand the metaphorical function of the fantastic in their tales, as I suspect monomic devices. Mystery is part of our world, even if we choose to deny its gift, even if we set out to strip everything we can of whatever mystery it possesses, and each time that's achieved, something is lost. A little bit later, in, or earlier rather, in Justin Mo interview, uh, again from 2018, he's asked again about uh, his system of magic. One of the most original things in your book, The Gardens of the Moon, is your system of magic. How did you conceive of your warrens and how did you tie them to your gods? So Erickson will say it developed organically. We were adapting the game's magic system in something we wanted to explore in the fantasy world. Warrens are, in a sense, planes of existence, but they also had aspects. So if you think of the four elements that the Greek would speak about, fire, air, water, and earth, we sort of attached magic capacities to these things and called them warrens. Then we added shadow and light, life and death. They were all aspected. If you draw on the warren of life, you can do things like healing. But we also want the magic system to be egalitarian, so it was based on discipline, research, and determination. Magic was there for being available to anyone. As anthropologists, we thought, how does that change the cultures around them? It occurred to us it would create a culture without a gender bias, so there would not be gender-based hierarchies of power. You would not maintain them because there would be no way to impose a power structure on either the genders. So it became a world without sexism, and that was very interesting to explore. 
Uh, he's also asked about the different races. And in Gardens of the Moon, you include different races, which sometimes live thousands of years. Why did you choose a timeline so wide? And he says, both Cameron and I, as archaeologists, we can come to a landscape and we can see the depths of time in that landscape. We wanted a sense of depths of time running back through this world as well. So there are layers of existence, layers of experience going back thousands of years. What made it interesting was that there are characters who actually experience all those layers, then we could explore the long-term views of humanity. Quite often, that's a difficult thing for each of us to do because we have such short lifespans. We can only think in terms of maybe one or two generations. But imagine somebody who can think in terms of 10,000 years. What is his view on history? What is their view on the human condition? That's worth exploring. Now, we shift a little bit before we get into the postmodern issue. There were comparisons, of course, between Game of Thrones and Book of the Fallen, particularly given that Game of Thrones, Song of Ice and Fire, George R. R. Martin was adapted to television. In the Lightspeed interview in 2013, it seems that the success of HBO's Game of Thrones has brought a large new group of readers to epic fantasy. Have you witnessed any shift lately in the popularity of the, that genre? Now notice what Erickson says here. Brilliant. It's funny because people sort of predicted that with Lord of the Rings films and then with Harry Potter and all the rest. What tends to happen is what I've called exceptionalism. And that is where an individual is sort of extracted from the genre in which they're writing and the popularity of the genre actually becomes less relevant than the individual. I think if anything is going to have that kind of effect of popularizing epic fantasy, it's probably going to be computer games and console games. As for myself, I'm constantly frustrated by most fantasy computer games for the simple reason that the stories are just lacking. I've dealt with some companies that wanted to do Malazan stuff and became aware that from their point of view, they want 80% action and 20% story. And I guess in many respects, I want it the other way around. We could say the same thing about television too. In Justin Mo interview, uh, your type of fantasy is an epic one with creatures and magic since the very beginning of Gardens of the Moon. Why did you choose this kind of fantasy and not a hard fantasy one like Game of Thrones? Erickson says, what we wanted to do, Cameron and I, was exploring what a world would be like if it had magic and actual gods. Once you do that, you sort of realize that we have a tradition here on Earth that match that kind of thing that kind of things like Homeric stuff, the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Odyssey, Gilgamesh, and maybe even Beowulf. These stories take the presence of gods, spirits, and monsters as a given. That makes your sensibilities very strange to us when you, we read them. Because we think, did these people believe these stories they were telling? Or did they take them and turn them into metaphor and symbolic meaning? Did they actually think these things exist in a literal sense? By exploring and creating a fantasy world where these things did exist in a literal sense, we could explore some aspects of the human condition that we can't get directly in this world. It's almost as if through the Malazan series and the fantasy world we created, we could re-examine things like Beowulf, Gilgamesh, and the Iliad. At least I could, and I find that quite fascinating because it allowed me to, to dispense with my skepticism about the settings of the Iliad and all the rest. That was really quite enjoyable. Game of Thrones and a lot of traditional epic fantasy often create an Eurocentric kind of sensibility. It would be a fantasy version of Europe. One of the things we wanted to avoid was that whole idea, because sometimes you could end up bringing across an assumption from this world to the fantasy one. We wanted to dispense with these assumptions. The main one for a Eurocentric fantasy setting would be patriarchy, and we did not want patriarchy in this world. Another assumption would be that there are barbarians to the north, there are hordes to the east, there's a decaying south. All these things that can get carrying across to a fantasy setting, which we, Cameron and I, even in our game, didn't want in it. We didn't like that. It's just bringing the prejudice across. With, it, with this world, it's very much a kind of colorblind world. By doing so, we can invent cultures very specific to the geographic regions without having to think about Earth-based cultures that would be similar. We can invent our own.
And this leads us into thinking about, you know, how what they're doing is under some rubric postmodern. So in the Lightspeed interview, 2013, uh, he's asked in interviews, you've said that you're glad people are talking about your work as an example of postmodernism. What sort of conversations have been going, around, going on around that? He says, well, basically I'm having an argument with a scholar who studied my stuff. Whereas I'm calling it postmodern, he's calling it poststructural. We sort of acknowledge each other's points, but neither of us budge. I mean, there's a strong postmodern element to a lot of the narrators within the Malazan series. In other words, they're aware that they're telling a story, and they're also aware that they have the option of manipulating that story. Krupa, I think, is one of the best examples of that. He narrates within the story, including applying the third-person viewpoint to himself, and so you can sort of sense he's messing with everyone's heads. And they may be the character's heads, but they're also the reader's heads. And that's a reflection of how I'm approaching it as a writer as well that one is aware there is manipulation running all the way through this. So then he's asked, so why does that critic think your work is post-structuralist? Erickson says, you'd have to ask him. The thing with scholars is that they don't really want the authors around. It sounds weird, but it certainly seems to be the case. We're far better off as far as the scholars are concerned if we'd been dead for 20 years. It makes it easier to build up a thesis without it having contradicted by the person whose work it is. And I think there's sometimes this assumption that the author is entirely unaware what they're up to, and that's certainly not the case with me. Now, we should pause here on a moment uh, and, and talk about this notion of postmodern. So let, let's put aside crazy, kooky, culture war, you know, postmodern is always bad sort of things. And let's also put aside people who are like, well, the postmodern is good, it's, it, it's wonderful. Erickson is working from a notion of the postmodern, I would say, that includes certain elements. For example, having narrators who know that they're narrating a story and that language can be manipulative. And the postmodern in this sense is sometimes you could say activists saying, eh, what if we had a world without patriarchy? But it's not doing so in a programmatic, formulaic, activist way. It's just saying, let's actually do this. Let's see what happens. Let's project it outward. There's all sorts of other things, elevating the stories of the people who have been left out of the elite brackets to do the storytelling. That's in some respects postmodern, but in other respects, it's kind of good fiction, good realism, good philosophy that's built into things. And so we're going to see a lot of interesting elements that could be called postmodern that play a central role in these works. In the uh, Caballero de Arbol Sonriente interview, much of the power of the Malazan novels lies in the cultural richness and racial background that Ian Esselmont and you built. It offers us a broad view of the different culture and social forms that may exist, something that's still not very common in fantasy, perhaps still too attached to settings close to medieval Europe. Do you think this wider perspective is what seduces fans of the saga so much? And Erickson says, I don't know. Schooled in anthropology, I suppose we had a sense that the real world wasn't exclusively a product of Europe and European thinking, its value systems, worldviews, and all the rest, and that history wasn't anything like that either. We're a complicated species, and all our cultural assumptions are diverse. By the time the novel started getting published, both Cam and I had already traveled a lot, and it was the kind of travel that forces a reset of the mind. Perspective became a tool for our fiction, but that challenge to perspective came from our life experiences in the real world. Once your eyes are opened to other possibilities, you can't close them again. Whether this is or was or is instrumental in how our works are valued or appreciated isn't really something that I can answer. Then he's asked about the Tlan Imas, these warriors from a previous race who turned themselves into living corpses. And he, he, uh, he's asked about that, what inspired you? And Erickson says, subverting the trope of the undead was consistent with a desire to subvert as many tropes as we could. Again, another typically postmodern idea, subversion, right? Working with something, keeping it partly in place, modifying it, showing the hidden potentials of it. Taking into account the first visual impact of a Tlan, Imas more or less invites the reader to certain assumptions and 
dismissal about their nature. Specifically, the reader is invited to see them as monsters. But monsters in the Malazan world are never what they seem, are they? This is kind of our point. Assumptions about the other are invariably simplistic. In uh, the interview in 2011 with Owen Williams, he's asked, Malazan Book of the Fallen consistently withholds information. I think that's one of the most divisive things about the series. That's where you shed the readers who don't understand that they're not supposed to understand or just hate it. Your dinosaur race are masters of technology. Are, be, are you being deliberately contrarian? Erickson says, yes. I delight in wrong-footing readers. I know it's perverse. I know it pisses some off so badly they turn away and never come back, to which I can only shrug. As for withholding information, it's more down to holding to a particular point of view tight with a single character at any one time, seeing only what they see, knowing only what they think they know, and believing only what they choose to believe. Once that becomes the rule, it's inevitable that information is not forthcoming that info dumps are practically impossible. And where attempts are made, the voice and imperfect point of view makes them unreliable and often flat out wrong. Now notice what he's going to say here. This is really quite interesting. And this has to do again with the theme of the postmodern. This isn't just the fantasy world of Malaz. It's our world, day in, day out, every effing moment. In fact, given that, what people are complaining about. While I suspect the ones complaining are the ones looking at a fat fantasy tome as a means of escaping from the confusion and overwhelming complexity of real life. Alas, I don't deliver on that. I just drag this world's crap over into that one, mess with a few rules of physics and whatnot, and sit back and watch. That's not contrarian, but it is, I suppose, subversive, especially to the tropes of the genre. But there's no way I can make the claim to being the first to do so. The most powerful example of this I know is, of course, Stephen Donaldson's Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, The Unbeliever, our crappy world and one miserable life dragged into a fantasy realm. That's probably the most subversive fantasy series ever written, breathtakingly, jaw-droppingly so. From what I hear, people either love it or hate it too, just like with my stuff. I feel privileged for that company. And I'm going to pause here for a moment and just say, you know, if you think about Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, Lord of the Rings is complex and murky. And the characters are often misguided and misled about how things actually stand as well in that. It's not as if there's a nice, beautiful fantasy genre over here prior to people like Stephen Donaldson or, or, uh, or um, Stephen Erickson who are, you know, subverting the genre. It's always been there. And we could say this about Ursula K. Le Guin and so many others as well. In the Lightspeed interview in 2013, um, we get this really interesting observation. I was reading some discussion of your books online, and I thought it was interesting how a couple people mentioned that a lot of your characters, even commoners, have these long philosophical discussions, and some people were questioning how realistic that was. And so here's what Erickson has to say. Some of the smartest, wisest people I've met, here, I'll give you an example. There was this guy who was hired with his shotgun to take care of our camp in Belize on an archaeology dig. No education, no teeth. And yet, if you would sit and talk with him, this guy thought about everything. He kept himself informed about world events and had read a whole series of books on philosophy. I think the assumption, I've been fighting against it for a long time in terms of creating characters, is that one assumes a level of intelligence or lack thereof on the basis of class, and I don't see it. I've never experienced it. Quite often, you won't get those heavy conversations with somebody who's struggling to stay alive. But at the same time, if you were to somehow sit down on a park bench and start talking, you might be surprised. It's easy, especially as a fiction writer, to fall into that kind of class-based thinking where you pigeonhole people and create characters who are minor characters with very little social standing and you give them no brains. I suppose it would be easy to do it that way, but I'm definitely not into that. And I've talked to soldiers, veterans, who think a lot about what they're up to. So I don't find it in any respect unusual. And again, a certain kind of postmodern approach there. Everybody's stories 
could in fact not just be interesting or valuable as information relators, but as agents, as people who have reflected, people who have thought, people who use their life experience and what, whatever they happen to encounter to engage in philosophical you know, thinking, reflection, whatever we want to call it, and can share that with others. In the Nekoplis uh, interview, He's asked, um, you kept us grounded with the soldiers. Where in the process did you and Cam come up with the bridge burners? With that, the presence of munitions, humanities, godsmackers, you make a choice not often seen in this mode of fiction. Why a focus or interest in sappers, or was it just another element? As a former combat engineer, this is something that immediately caught my eye, not only in the books, but in this interview as well. Steven Erickson says, the notion of munitions probably arrived as a counterweight to sorcery, a means for non-magic practicing characters to, as you say, level the field. We were also drawn to the grim and often miserable world of the foot soldier, one you see very rarely explored in most fantasy fiction. It was always the rulers and leaders and great heroes leading the massed ranks, never that blurred, anxious face in the ranks themselves. Armies were fodder, something to end up strewn on the churn, churned up bloody fields of history, real or imagined. To me, such victims represent the most tragic element to large-scale combat. It's their lives that are ruined by the desires and ambitions of their leaders. The victims are where my compassion finds a home. For both Cam and myself, it's where our emotion our empathy is most fully engaged. That may be in the end what makes them so compelling and entertaining. I've been in enough airports down in the States to see soldiers returning from Iraq and to see in the eyes of them something blasted, wounded, and it breaks my heart. And you feel something like that in the end of Dead House Gates, seeing what happens to some of these characters you've been following this entire time, like Dweezer, the historian who meets his, his end after so much struggle, the one who is carrying things forward. And this is where we're going to end. Again, in the Caballero de Arbol Sonriente interview, one of the central themes or leitmotif of the saga I find very fascinating is the unwitnessed. As an expert of history, you know well that what is recorded often has little to do with what really happened. Do you intend to emphasize the value of decisive events or moments that history never fairly captures or outright forgets in its brainy books? Here's what Erickson has to say. The notion of unwitnessed developed over time as the series went on as I continued exploring the notion of heroism, which is generally understood as valuative. An action must be witnessed to be judged as heroic or not heroic, or maybe not. Can it not also be said that many unwitnessed acts can in essence be identical to witnessed acts deemed heroic, and does that not make them intrinsically heroic? In other words, can the valuative stand outside of being witnessed? And if so, how does that even work? Well, it can only work through story. We're in an audience asserted as being outside the world within the story, act as invisible and unacknowledged witnesses to acts within the story and within the story world that are, that, that are then judged as heroic. It's a shifting of the focus to the nature of story itself and an implicit acknowledgement of audience as an integral component to the whole thing. And I think that this comes out so, so strongly in what happens in Dead House Gates at the very end, where we have, um, you know, the chain of dogs um, making it, at least the refugees and the soldiers and the fist have been left behind and they're going to be wiped out in front of the gates of the city that they've done so much to take everybody to. And we find that um, already false stories are being circulated around uh, about that. And, um, you know, we see that the historian himself is going to be put to death. 
So a lot to think about there, a lot that's contributed to us by these wonderful interviews with Steven Erickson, where he reveals his mindset, his orientation, his goals, and his purposes. There are many themes that we could consider of philosophical depth and importance woven into these two malas on Book of the Fallen novels. And perhaps one of the most interesting one is in part signified by talking about the ascendants, these powerful beings that are at odds with each other and often working at cross purposes and intrude into the affairs of human beings and the other races that are still around within this world. And I think we could extend this further to thinking not so much about freedom and determinism because that's not really raised. You know, is everything fated? Do we have any control over our lives? As it is in other fantasy series of similar scope to this, but rather, what is it that people do when involved with, faced with the more powerful, the, in some cases, divine, in other cases, we could say diabolical. And I think it's helpful for us to look at some of the passages in which we get to see characterizations that are taking place of the relations and the choices and actions. And so I've got a number of passages selected to look at. And the first one comes up right at the beginning of the work when the Fisher girl is going to be uh, taken over by Cotillion or the rope uh, of the House of Shadow. And uh, what we see here is that Shadow Throne and the Hounds and Cotillion are all there. And this Fisher girl is there after the hounds have killed this, all these soldiers. So Cotillion says, um, using my name, Amanus, means you've just decided for me. We can hardly leave her here now, can we? And uh, Amanus says, of course we can, old friend, just not breathing. Cotillion looked down on the girl. No, he said quietly, she'll do. And then Cotillion says, it's going to take a little time. And then Amana says, and have we time? True vengeance needs the slow, careful stalking of the victim. Have you forgotten the pain she once delivered us? Lacine's back is against the wall already. That's the Empress of Malazan. She might fall without our, our help. Where would be the satisfaction in that? Cotillion's response was cool and dry. You've always underestimated the Empress, hence our present circumstances. No, we'll need this one. Lacine's raised the ire of moon spawn, and that's a hornet nest if there ever was one. The timing is perfect. And then um, she's asked, have you a name? And Cotillion says, enough. She's not some mouse under your paw, Amanus. Besides, I've chosen her and I will choose her name as well. And uh, she pleads for her, her life. I've done nothing. My father's a poor man, but he'll pay you all he can. He needs me in the twine. He's waiting right now. And Cotillion says, I've no choice anymore, child. After all, you know our names. And what ends up happening, the shadows whirled out to engulf the girl with the cold touch her mind fell away down into darkness. Her last fleeting sensation was of the soft wax of the candle in her right hand and how it seemed to well up between the fingers of her clenched fist. She is possessed by Cotillion of the House of Shadow, the assassin. Um, a little bit later on, we are you know, seeing what's, what's uh, going on in the battle between the army of Malazan and the mages along with them and um, an alliance that has been formed against them. So here we go. Uh, drawing her cloak against the chilled tattersail paused outside the tent and turned to study the enormous mountain 
hanging suspended a quarter mile above the city of Pale. She scanned the battered face of Moon Spawn, its name for as long as she could remember. Black, ragged as a blackened tooth, the basalt fortress was home to the most powerful enemy the Malazan Empire had ever faced. High above the earth, Moon Spawn could not be breached by siege. Even Lacine's own undead army, the Tlani Mas, who traveled as easily as dust on the wind, were unable or unwilling to penetrate its magical defenses. Pale's wizards had found a powerful ally. Tattersail recalled that the Empire had locked horns with the moon's mysterious lord once before in the days of the Emperor. Things had threatened to get ugly, but then Moonspawn withdrew from the game. No one still living knew why. Just one of the thousand secrets the Emperor took with him to his watery grave. The moon's reappearance here on Genabacus had been a surprise, and this time there was no last-minute reprieve. A half-dozen legions of the sorceress Tista Andi descended from Moon Spawn, and under the command of a warlord named Caladon Brood, they joined forces with the Crimson Guard mercenaries. Together, the two armies proceeded to drive back the Malaz Fifth Army, which had been pushing eastward along the northern edge of Rivi Plain. For the past four years, the battered Fifth had been bogged down in Black Dog Forest, forcing them to to take a stand against Brood and the Crimson Guard. It was a stand fast becoming a death sentence. But clearly, Caledon Brood and the Tistiandi weren't the only inhabitants of Moon Spawn. An unseen lord remained in command of the fortress, bringing it here and sealing a pact with Pale's formidable wizards. So we're going to find out who this is uh, quite soon. And there's something quite interesting happening there. It's going to be an Ascendant. We have another character who meets an Ascendant uh, not long after that, and this is Paran. Paran opened his eyes to bright, hot sunlight, but the sky above him was wrong. He saw no sun. The yellow glare was sharp yet sourceless. Heat gusted down on him with oppressive weight. A moaning sound filled the air, not wind, because there was no wind. He tried to think, tried to recall his last memories, but the past was blank, torn away, and only fragments remained. A ship's cabin, a thunk of a dagger as he flung it again against a wooden post. A man with rings, hair of white, grinning sardonically. He rolled on one side, seeking the source of the moaning sound. A dozen paces away on the flat plain that was neither grass nor earth rose an arched gateway leading to nothing. I've seen such gates before, none so large, I think, as this one, none looking like this thing. Twisted, upright, yet from his position sideways, the gate was not, he realized, made of stone. Bodies, naked human figures, carved likenesses? No, oh no, the figures moved, groaned, slowly writhed in place. Flesh blackened as if stained with peat, eyes closed and mouths open with faint, endless moans. Paran climbed to his feet, staggered as a wave of dizziness ran through him, then fell once again to the ground. Something like indecision, a voice said coolly. Blinking, Paran rolled on his back. Above him stood a young man and women, twins. The man wore loose silk clothing, white and gold. His thin face was pale, expressionless. His twin was wrapped in a shimmering purple cape, her blonde hair casting reddish glints. It was the man who'd spoken. He smiled without humor down at Paran. We've long admired your... His eyes widened. Sword, what the woman finished, a smirk in her tone. Far more subtle than, say, a coin, don't you think? The man's smile turned mocking. Most, he said, swinging his head to study the ghastly edifice of the gate. Don't pause here. It said there was a cult once in the habit of drowning victims in bogs. I imagine Hood finds them aesthetically pleasing. Hardly surprising, the woman drawled, that death has no taste. So where is Peron? He's been killed, and he's at the gate of Hood, the lord of death, of house death. Peron tried to sit up, but his limbs refused the command. He dropped his head back, feeling the strange loam yield to its weight. What has happened? He rasped. You were murdered, the man said lightly. Peron closed his eyes. Why then have I not passed through Hood's gate, if that's what it is? We're meddling, the woman said. 
And now we find out who it is. Open, the twins of chance, and my sword, my untested blade, purchased years ago with a name I chose so capriciously. What does open want from me? Only this stumbling, ignorant thing you call your life, dear boy. The trouble with ascendants is they try to rig every game. Of course, we delight in uncertainty. Oops, the man said. Come to make certain of things, I'd say. We'd best leave, sister. Sorry, Captain, but it seems you'll pass through that gate after all. Maybe, the woman said. Her brother rounded on her. We agreed. No confrontation. Confrontation's messy, unpleasant. I despise discomforting scenes. Besides, the ones who come don't play fair. And neither do we, the sister snapped. She turned to the gate, raised her voice. Lord of death, we would speak with you, Hood. Peron rolled his head watched as a bent, limping figure emerged from the gate. Wearing rags, the figure slowly approached. Peron squinted an old woman, a child with drool on its chin, a deformed young girl, a stunted, broken trell, a desiccated tistandi. Oh, make up your mind, the sister said. The apparition cocked a death head, the grin of its teeth stained muddy yellow. You have chosen, it said unimaginatively. You are not Hood, the brother scowled. Bones shifted under creaking skin. The Lord is busy. Busy? We don't take kindly to insults, the sister said. The apparition cackled and stopped abruptly. How unfortunate a mellifluous, deep-throated laugh would be more to my liking. Ah, well, in answer, nor does my Lord appreciate your interruption of this natural passage of a soul. Murdered at the hand of a god, the sister said, that makes him fair game. And what, what is the god? Cotillion. The creature grunted, sh shuffled close to look down at Peron. The eye sockets glimmered faintly as if old pearls hid within the shadows. What open, it asked as it studied Peron, do you wish of my lord? Nothing for me, the brother said, turning away. Sister, even for the gods, she replied, death awaits, an uncertainty hiding deep within them. She paused. Make them uncertain. The creature cackled again and again cut it short. Reciprocity. Of course, the sister responded. I'll look for another. A death premature, meaningless even. The apparition was silent and the head creaked in a nod. In this mortal shadow, of course? Agreed. My shadow, Peron asked. What does that mean precisely? Much sorrow, alas, the apparition said. Someone close to you shall walk through death's gates in your place. No, take me instead, I beg of you. Be quiet, snapped the apparition. Pothos makes me ill. So what ends up happening is Peron is saved and will live met not just another day, but many another day. And we see a confrontation here between two of the ascendants, one of the house of death and the other one of the spoilers, you could call it. A little bit later, we get to see uh, another ascendant, and it turns out that there's a whole bunch of these great ravens. Um, and the great ravens have a lord. Uh, they work for the lord of the moon. She says, I am Crone, eldest of the moon's great ravens, whose eyes have looked upon a hundred thousand years of human folly. Hence my tattered coat and broken beak, as evidence of your indiscriminate destruction. I am but a win winged witness to your eternal madness. And um, she's going to uh, tell the uh, Baruch, my lord is possessed of honor and courtesy. I shall call him then? And Baruch says, yes, do so. Um, and who is that Lord going to be? It is the great ascendant who is running the uh, place, um, the son of darkness, moon's lord, Anamander Rake of House Dark. Going on, um, we get to meet Rake uh, coming to see Baruch in the, the city, uh, uh, you know, and explaining some things that are going on. He says, um, here we go. Um, 
city. There was a city within moon spawn. I cannot defend an entire moon, Rake says. I cannot be everywhere at once. As for Teishren, he didn't give a damn about the people around him. I thought to dissuade him, make the price too high. To save the home of my people, I retreated. Leaving Pale, the city, to fall. Baruch shut his mouth, cursing his lack of tact. Rake merely shrugged. I didn't anticipate I'd face a full assault. My presence alone had been keeping the Empire at bay for almost two years. You've asked to meet with me, Anamander Rake, and so here we are. What is it you wish from me? An alliance, the moon's lord answered. With me, personally? No games, Baruch. Rake's voice was suddenly cold. I'm not fooled by that council of idiots bickering at Majesty Hall. I know that it's you and your fellow mages who rule the city, Darugistan. I'll tell you this. For the Empress, your city is the lone pearl on this continent of mud. She wants it, and what she wants, she usually gets. Baruch reached down and plucked at his frayed edge of his robe. I see, he said in a low voice. Pale had its wizards. Rake frowned. Indeed. Yet, Baruch continued, when the battle was begun in earnest, your first thought was not for the alliance you made with the city, but for the well-being of your moon. Who told you this? Rake demanded. Baruch looked up and raised his hand. Some of those wizards managed to escape. They're in the city. Rake's eyes had gone black. Why? I want their heads, Rake replied casually. Why? And the answer is, when the Moranth army came down from the mountains and Tashran rode at its head of his wizard cadre and when word spread that the Empire Claw had infiltrated the city, the wizards of Pale fled. I dispatched the Claw when they were but a dozen steps within the wall. Had the city's wizards remained, the assault would have been repelled. Tashran was preoccupied with other imperatives. So he says, I pulled the moon back mere minutes from its destruction. I let it south, drift south and went after those wizards. After them, I tracked down all but two. I want those two preferably alive, but their heads will suffice. So what we see is uh, an alliance shifting and beginning between this ascendant and the city, those who actually run this city and are fighting against Malazan. Later on, we get to see what has happened through the possession of Cotillion. This is um, Whiskey Jack and uh, thinking about Quick Ben and Kalam and this girl, Sari. What had pulled a 17-year-old girl into the world of war? He couldn't understand it. He couldn't get past her youthfulness, couldn't see beyond to the cold, murderous killer behind those dead eyes. As much as he told his squad she was as human as any of them, the doubts grew with every question about her he could not answer. He knew almost nothing about her. The revelation she could manage a fishing boat had come from seemingly nowhere, and here in Darugistan, she'd hardly acted like a girl raised in a fishing village. There was a natural poise about her, a measure of assurance more common to the higher educated classes. No matter where she was, she carried herself as if she belonged there. Did that sound like a 17-year-old girl? No, but it seemed to match Quick Ben's assertions, and that galled him. How else to match her with that icy cold woman torturing prisoners outside Nathalog. He could look at her and part of him would say, young, not displeasing to the eye, a confidence that makes her magnetic. Well, another part of his mind snapped shut. Young? Oh no, not this last. She's old. She walked under a blood red moon in the dawn of time, did this one. Her face is the face of all that cannot be fathomed and she's looking at you in the eye, Whiskey Jack, and you'll never know what she's thinking. Why not? Because she is possessed by an ascendant. Finally, Quick Ben, Whiskey Jack's mage, uh, one of the uh, famous sappers, is um, meeting with one of the lords, the king of the house, the house of shadow. And we find that he's meeting with Shadow Throne. 
Shadowkeep rose from the plain like an enormous lump of black glass, fractured with curving planes, rippled in places with some corners glistening white as if crushed. The largest surface facing them, a wall he supposed, was mottled and dull, as if it was a cortex, the weathered surface of obsidian. They arrived, and the wizard exclaimed in surprise as Blind strode into the stone and disappeared. He hesitated, and Baran came as close to nudging him as Quick Ben allowed. He walked up to the mottled stone and held his hands as he stepped into it. And who does he meet there? The lord of it. As he approached, he saw the figure seated there. It seemed composed of almost translucent shadows, vaguely human in form but hooded, preventing even the glint of eyes. Still, Quick Ben could feel the god's attention fixed solely on him, and he barely repressed a shiver. Shadow Throne spoke. Sean tells me you know the names of my hounds. Quick Ben stopped before the dais. He bowed. I was once an acolyte within your temple, Lord. The god was silent for a time. Then he said, Is it wise to admit such a thing, wizard? Do I look kindly upon those who once served me, but then abandon my ways? Tell me, I would hear from you what my priests teach. To begin on the path of shadow and then to leave it is rewarded by the rope. Meaning, I am marked for assassination by all who follow your ways, Lord. Yet here you stand, wizard. Quick Ben bowed again. I would strike a deal, Lord. The god giggled, then raised a hand. No, dear Shan, strike not. Quick Ben stiffened. The black hound stepped around him and ascended the dais. She lay down before her god and eyed the wizard blankly. Do you know why I just saved your life, wizard? I do, Lord. Shan wants you to tell me. Shadow Throne loves deals. So that is um, part of what's, what's going on there. Um, can you actually deal with a god? And the answer is yes, because these gods are ascended humans. At least some of them are. Now, in uh, Dead House Gates, we get to meet some other interesting characters like this. By this time, Cotillion has uh, let Sari go. She's actually taken on a different name, Osplar, the goddess of thieves, and is connected with Crocus, who is the coin bearer of the twins. And now, um, here in this section... We get to see um, them talking about the shadow cult and this high priest of it. And uh, there's a little bit of reflection here. Be calm. Cotillion is done with possessing the last. The bane of Anamander Rake's threat remains. Who wants the crude conveyor of civilized mayhem crashing through the temple door? Not Shadow Throne, not the patron of assassins. She is protected still. Besides which, Cotillion finds no further value in using her, and indeed the residue of his talent still within her gives cause for secret concern. Right? So they are uh, relating what's going on there. And then shortly after that, they talk about the House of the Azov. And here we're going to get a very interesting revelation. So they're, they're talking about the, these houses. And it turns out the house of the Azoth uh, exist all over the place. They're connected by one warren. And they are as old as time itself, you might say. So there, this is part of what's being said. There's the old story that the emperor and dancer, oh, Hood. Hood is, of course, the lord of death. This is a swear. Kelenvad and Dancer, Amanas and Cotillion, the possible linkage with Shadow, this temple. Fiddler shot Iskarel Puss, the priest of Shadow, a sharp look. The high priest sported an avid grin, his eyes glittering. Uh, the legend goes that Kelvanad, Kelav, Kelanvad and Dancer once occupied one such house in Mala's city. Dead house, Ikarium said from the doorway. The legend is true. I, Fiddler mothered, then shook himself. Well enough, in any case, it's Quick Ben's belief. All such houses are linked to one another via gates of some sort, and travel is possible. And so they, they're relating this. Now, it turns out that the Emperor and Dancer were killed, but also ascended. They are 
the shadow throne and the rope cotillion that we've met earlier. Um, a little bit later, we're going to see something uh, quite interesting. Um, shadow throne is talking to this demon apt, right? And um, what's happened is 1,300 Malazan children had been staked out there on crosses by the rebels. Um, and all of these are, all of these children's bodies are now gone. The X-shaped wooden crosses were bare with only stains of blood, urine, and excrement to show that living beings had once hung from them in agony. In the darkness, the plain was strangely alive with shadows flowing sourcelessly over the motionless grasses. Why? Well, as it turns out that Apt, the demon, has um, wanted all of these children to be, in some respect, saved, right? And so Kalam did as well. So Shadow Throne says to her, Am I a cutter, a healer? Is Cotillion a kindly uncle? Are my hounds farmyard skulkers and orphans puppies? Have you gone entirely insane? Apt spoke in a rapid, rasping series of clicks and hisses. Of course Kalam wanted to save them, the Shadow Throne shrieked. But he knew it was impossible. Only vengeance was possible. But now? Now I must exhaust my powers in healing a thousand maimed children? And for what? Apt spoke again. Servants? And precisely how big do you think Shadow Keep is, you one-armed imbecile? The demon said nothing, her slate gray, multifaceted eye glimmering in the starlight. Shadow Throne hunched suddenly his gauze-like cloak, wrapping cloak as he hugged himself. An army of servants, he whispered. Servants, abandoned by the Empire, led to their fates at the hand of Shaikh's bloodlusted bandits. There will be ambivalence in their scarred, malleable souls. I see long-term benefits in your precipitous act, demon. Lucky for you. And there's one single boy who is going to be uh, saved, uh, who's, who's sort of special in that bunch. Um, a little bit later, we um, find that there's um, Felicin is... Um, Who's, who's had a very terrible uh, path. Um, she's been raped and abused and stuff like that. She is actually going to become the next shike. The She's going to be possessed by the whirlwind itself, right? And so what we see happening here is um, she's, she's essentially a rebirth of this figure who's been going from body to body. A cascade of thoughts swept through Felicin as she climbed into the stone platform. Shike reborn, that dark cloud of Drygina, which is the whirlwind, descending. Felicin, noble-born brat of Utna, whore of the mining pit, open the holy book and thus complete the rite. That young woman has seen the face of the abyss, that terrible journey behind her. Now comes the demand that she face the one before her. The young woman must relinquish her life, opening the holy book, yet who would have thought the God is so amenable to a deal? She knows my heart, and that grants her the confidence, it seems, of deferring her claim on it. The deal has been struck, power granted, so many visions, yet Felicine remains. Her rock-hard scarred soul floats free in the vast abyss. Felesin stepped past the giant. Drina's power trickled into her. Ah, dear goddess, precious patron, do you now hesitate in your gifts like this crowd, like Leoman? Do you await the proof of my words, my intent? And then she has this engagement with the mages. And then she thinks, the whirlwind was nothing but preparation for this. The, this, the raising of Drina's star, standard, the spear that is the apocalypse, a standard to tower over an entire continent, seen by all, now at last the war begins, my war. So she's opposing the empire. She's also opposing her sister, who is the new uh, adjunct to the empress. And we're going to close with a scene from almost the very end of Dead House Gates, where... The Empress is encountered 
and Kalam, the assassin, has gone in and is ready to kill her. And we find out something else. So the Empress is not uh, an ascendant. She is a human being, but the most powerful human being in terms of her command of the, uh, perhaps the world at that time. So it turns out that there was a plan in mind. So she tells him, here we go. The outlawing of Dujek, the high fist, was, is a temporary measure, a ruse. In fact, we perceived the threat that was the Pannonian, uh, Pannion dom, Domen. Dujek, however, was of the opinion he could not deal with it on his own. We needed to fashion allies of enemies, Kalam. We needed Darugistan's resources. We needed Kaladan Brood and his Rivian Bargas. We needed Anamander Rake and his Tist Andi. We needed the Crimson Guard off our backs. Now, none of these formidable forces are strangers to pragmatism. One and all, they could see the threat represented by the Pontian seer and his rising empire. But the question of trust remained problematic. I agreed to Dujek's plan to cut him and his host loose. As outlaws, they are, in, in effect, distanced from the Malazan empire and its desires, our answer, if you will, to the issue of trust. Kalam's eyes narrowed in thought. And who knows of this ruse? Only Dujek and Tashrin, the high mage, who betrayed the other mages. He heard the smile as she said, Ah, well, he remains in the background out of sight, but there for Dujek should one arm need, need him. Tashrin is Dujek's, how do you soldiers say it? His shaved knuckle, his, as we say, ace in the hole. Kalam was silent for a long minute. The only sounds in the chamber were his breathing and the slow but steady drip of his blood onto the flagstones. Then he said, there are older crimes that remain. The assassin frowned, the only sounds. Assassinating Kalanvad and Dancer. I, I ended their rule of the Malazan Empire, usurped the throne, a most vicious betrayal in truth. An empire is greater than any lone mortal, including you, including me. An empire enforces its own necessities, makes demands in the name of duty, and that particular burden is something that you as a soldier must certainly understand. I knew those two men very well, Kalam, a claim you cannot make. I answered a necessity I could not avoid with reluctance, with anguish. Since that time, I've made grievous errors in judgment, and I must live with those. And so he leaves the empress doesn't kill her as he'd intended to. She's still in place. So what we see here are all of these very interesting, intricate plots and interactions of these powerful beings. But, and if we had the time to go into further philosophical themes, we would also talk about all the little people involved as well and the solidarity that some of them show with each other. But, I think we're going to have to wrap this up here because we've already uh, exhausted so much time in discussing this one philosophical theme. We will be revisiting the novels in this series, coming back to the third and fourth in the next uh, session of this. And perhaps down the line, we'll go through fifth through tenth as well. But for, for now, this suffices to bring our study of these two great Malazan Book of the Fallen novels to a close. And I hope that if you haven't read them, that you check them out. Really wonderful fantasy. And if you have read them, hopefully you've resonated with and responded to some of the things that we've discussed in this session.